listening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for joining us for Final Cut 10, Now What? My name is Michael Kamas, and I'm the Senior Technology and Workflow Consultant here at Keycode Media, and we appreciate you being here in beautiful downtown Burbank, as well as all over the globe, online via our stream. <clears throat> If we jump back into the Wayback Machine, the technology Wayback Machine, into the ancient days of computers, say maybe 10 years ago, uh, Windows XP didn't exist, Mac OS X didn't exist, and all of you were still stealing music from Napster and pissing off the record companies. And a little company north of here called Apple released a piece of software called Final Cut Pro. And quickly, the industry adopted it. It became uh, part of our post lexicon. It caused us to rethink how we handle post. In fact, Apple's tagline back then was, think different. So we fast forward 10 years to now. In fact, you may have heard that Apple's pushed out a new piece of software in the past couple months called Final Cut Pro 10. And now, we're caught, now uh, we have to re-examine post yet again. So we've assembled this panel of experts to examine that. Where are we going? How do we get there? And is Final Cut 10 even a blip on our radar? So let's meet these guests and see exactly who we're talking to tonight. So sitting to my right is a man whose name and uh, voice is synonymous with Funnel Cup Pro. He's a producer, director, editor, writer, and trainer for over 30 years. He's a member of both the Directors Guild of America and the Producers Guild of America. He's one of the top corporate producers in America and has also written five, count them five, books on Funnel Cut Studio. <laughs> He's created hundreds of hours of online training, which I've taken all of them, and is an ex executive producer and host of the Digital Production Buzz. Please welcome Mr. Larry Jordan. Next, it's a gentleman whose name is commonplace here in Hollywood. His work with file-based acquisition has given new shape to the industry. His founding of Plaster City in 2003, and now as the CEO of Light Iron Digital, his credit list includes some of the biggest films in Hollywood over the past couple years, including Pirates of the Caribbean 4, The Amazing Spider-Man, The Social Network, Underworld, Total Recall. That's the new Total Recall, right? OK. <laughs> CBS's Criminal Minds, and just to shake things up, the Muppet movie. Please give a warm <laughs> welcome to Michael Cioni. Next, we have a man who, uh, quite frankly, I don't know where the myth ends and the man begins. He's a film and music editor with a credit list including Heather's, The Cotton Club, and Oliver, St uh, Oliver Stone's Wild Palms. He's a writer and blogger with nearly 100 published articles and professor and editing trackhead at the USC School of Cinematic Arts. He's developed curriculums and workshops for scholastic facilities worldwide, as well as major Hollywood studios. He belongs to more organizations than you can fit in a business card, but most importantly, he's a damn nice guy. Please welcome Norman Holland. <laughs> Next, we have a man who's had the editing responsibilities for some of the most successful shows on cable television. His work was featured on The Real World, the hidden camera show Punked, and currently, uh, a favorite guilty pleasure of mine, Tosh.0. He not only lends his talent to editing, but also to the IT and infrastructure side, most notably the Funnel Cup Pro transition of Buna Murray, one of the largest Funnel Cup Pro houses uh, here in Hollywood. His company, Helium Digital, continues to edit, but also consult on workflows. Please welcome the third Michael to this panel, Michael Gasson. <laughs> Lastly, and just barely, we have someone who's on the front lines daily. His assistant editing work over the past few years runs the gamut. Uh, he's worked on iCarly, Eureka, which just got canceled, I'm sorry. The Cleveland Show, Project One Way, at Runway, pardon me, and The Hills. He also uh, has edited feature films like Punk's Not Dead and Spit. Most recently, he signed on to assist on the new MTV series, Teen Wolf. Please welcome Jeremy Weinstein. <laughs> so gentlemen, let's start off pretty basic. Um, those of you who are currently editing out in the field, and, uh, are any of you seeing Final Cut 10? Is it in any of your workflows currently? I'm hearing crickets. Uh, no. no. I, 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 my, I've seen pictures yeah. of it. <laughs> I would say I, I, I do use Final Cut 10, uh, and uh, it's mainly for um, stuff that is direct to um, uh, not to go to cinema. So just basically things that are like promo developments or sometimes uh, uh, promo put togethers. And it also has really, really great um, tools with regard to quick transcoding for file uploads to various different places. So I'm sort of experimenting it with those tools because it's easy to drag and drop and an export and a move and little things like that. But in editorial, 
I don't think any of us okay. yet, no. So would you say it fits into a workflow, or would you say it's more of a standalone application currently? I would say right now it's uh, uh, starting to be the beginning of little workflow sort of plot points. It just kind of finds its way in little areas. Uh, of course, that's how things go, and then those, those sort of masses grow. Okay, so uh, that's currently, uh, anyone else, has anyone else had any discussions? I, I, we've been a I've been asked because, uh, you know, we do a lot of supervised sessions um, and they hate waiting for things to render, you know, so being able to do that, it would be a benefit, but, um, you know, we're right in the middle of the season right now, so it's just, we're not ready to, to switch everything right now, at least. I don't know about you guys. Uh, no, we, we are just finishing up the first season of Team Wolf, and uh, we got picked up for another season, but we spoke about Final Cut X, or 10, and uh, we decided it wasn't ready for, uh, for us yet. So uh, we hope that it will be at some point, but right now it's not ready for broadcast. So um, I don't know. We're not going to make it more difficult for us when we have good at We used Final Cut 7 this season. We didn't have much of a problem with it. Um, but Final Cut 10 wouldn't be the choice to go with at this point. Well, I think we all know since Final Cut 10 is out, obviously Final Cut 7 is at some point going to go away, right? It's been end of life, although it's supported in 10.7. So has anyone been looking into other editing applications or uh, boning up on uh, st stuff you may already know, such as you know, Avid, Premiere, Vegas, et cetera? Well, I can talk about from, from what we teach at USC, because uh, we've examined all sides of this since we have to stay slightly behind the industry, I suppose, um, and react to what's there. And I basically tell our students that they need to know all the platforms. And in various portions of the school, we support a lot of Media Composer, Final Cut 7, as well as the Adobe Suite. Uh, and um, I feel that the more our students know, the better off they are. That clearly, they'll be placed for uh, FCP 10 uh, in different areas, and they should know that. Uh, but we're not prepared to teach that and support it and try and figure out what machines it could work on and what not at the school. So we have, we have 160 workstations, um, and upgrading them would be a physical nightmare. So that uh, we just, we're not ready to go there yet. I'm, I'm assuming that part of the editing curriculum at USC is not only the what buttons to push, but also this, the, the concept of storytelling, obviously, mm -hmm. and tools. Mm -hmm. um, what does the term bin mean, right? Mm -hmm. And I know that with Final Cut 10, there's been kind of a paradigm shift, right? There isn't the traditional bin. And so the terminology has changed. Do you think that these changes in how Apple is uh, suggesting the new paradigm is going to be detrimental? Or do you think it's a, a, a bonus for your students? Can they learn with this new software the history of film? Yeah, I, it, listen. And I think that uh, I, I'm going to differentiate two things. We don't have any classes that say how to use Media Composer, how to use Final Cut. All of our classes say storytelling one, storytelling two. Um, so those classes stop short of really giving a damn about whether you call it a bin or not. Um, there are labs attached to all of that. And our experience is once you know one of the technologies, then the translation for smart people is relatively easy. So it doesn't matter whether you're going to hop from Media Composer to Final Cut or Final Cut 7 to Final Cut 10. It's just a question of retraining a few muscles. So I don't really expect any problem there. Larry, what about you? I know obviously you teach a lot of Final Cut. Um, do you find that when you're teaching people some of the fundamentals, the basic fundamentals of film, that there's something lost in the translation with this new version of Final Cut? I think that's a good question, but it's the wrong question. What is the right question then? Why would anybody be interested in Final Cut 10? That and was I our think, second break, Larry. And I think still my thunder. <laughs> but go on. <laughs> See, I, I look around the room and we're located in Burbank, and we're talking to what could be arguably the highest of the high-end professional user. And the assumption, therefore, is that if Final Cut 10 does not appeal to the high-end user, it therefore has no value. And I think that's an incorrect assumption. Uh, just to, to put you on the spot for a second, do you know anyone that's editing using Avid Media Composer 3? 
Uh, quite a few, actually. Uh, has, uh, <laughs> has uh, Avid Media Composer 3 uh, been updated in the last, oh, three years? The uh, Avid Media Composer 3, no. Right. So obviously they can't do broadcast quality work with a piece of software that was not updated in the last three years. Isn't that true? <laughs> I, I think that's an unfair comparison. I think it is an exact comparison because it assumes that in order for us to do high quality work, mm -hmm. we have to have the absolute latest tool. Do you remember when Final Cut 4 shipped? Oh, yes, I do, yeah. Okay. Did Final Cut 4.0 work? <laughs> not very well. Did Final Cut 4.01 work? The answer is slightly no. better. How about 4.02? <laughs> no. 4.03? No. 4.04? That was the good the version of the software. So what we're seeing is, I think, a rush to judgment. And I'm not to defend Apple. God knows they've done a great job of making my life miserable for the last several months. But <laughs> let's take a look at the bigger picture. The bigger picture is everybody at this room, with me accepted and perhaps you, every one of these people are professional storytellers. I was talking with uh, a, a gentleman, uh, Alan uh, Edward Bell. Alan Edward Bell, Edison on an Avon, did Water for Elephants. And we were talking, because at those days everybody was saying, we're switching to Avid or we're switching to Premiere. So my show, Digital Production Buzz, did a whole show dedicated to Avid and a whole show dedicated to Premiere. And we interviewed Alan. And I said, Alan, does it really make a difference what tool you edit? He said, it makes me a little faster. But I'm an editor. You give me an Avid, you give me Premiere, you give me Final Cut, you give me Vegas, you give me a film bin. At the end of the day, I'm going to give you the same story. It may take me longer to get there, but I'm going to get the same story. So what we're arguing about is whether this hammer is better than another hammer. For this audience, at this time, uh, Final Cut 10 is not ready for the high-end audience. And we can point to all kinds of reasons. Doesn't support work groups, doesn't support multicam, doesn't support uh, network file devices, doesn't do this, doesn't do that. So obviously, Final Cut 10 is not yet ready for the people sitting to my right. But that doesn't mean that it's not ready for other people. I get. 300 emails a day, and, and some people are writing vividly angry at how Final Cut 10 has ruined their business, and I'm absolutely sure that's true. And other people are saying, Final Cut 10 has finally allowed me to not have to be a film editor, I can be a storyteller, and I can tell stories using a piece of software that allows me to do stuff I could never do before. And I think that's the real magic, is that does it enable us to tell stories? And anything that says, well, if this technical tool, this is a ball-peen hammer. You can't use a ball-peen hammer to cut rock. It's a ball-peen hammer, for heaven's sake. It's a hammer. All right, if it works for you, it's a tool. If it doesn't work for you, get a different tool. I'm done. Well, <laughs> I think a great, um, a great analogy without talking hammers here. Um, but well, we had one on the video. That's a hammer. That's right. That's a big mallet. Um, uh, one of the, the I, I'm on a uh, group of people who uh, help advise some of the nonlinear editing companies around. And uh, Avid came in early on and showed us uh, Five when Avid Five was coming out with this new great smart tools thing. And most of the editors on this panel, you would have thought that. Avid came and said, we are going to kill each one of your children in front of you right now. Um, so for, for people who have to work in front of a monitor with a director or producer of varying degrees of obnoxiousness over their shoulder like this, um, you don't want to change. You want the tools where they're going to be so you can be comfortable with it. Um, for people who are not working in that world, change is cool. And they will probably, and I'm not saying Final Cut Pro 10 is that great change that everybody's going to move to. I'm just saying that once people get over the idea that it's not the way it used to be, some of us embrace that. And, and it is just an evolution, as you said, Michael. Um, uh, and you get used to new terminology. You get used to new button placements. Oh my god, they took the lifting man out of Avid Media Composer. How horrible. Um, uh, eventually, you figure out that that button does something very similar. So um, I think it's really an issue of the, the manner in which you work, the comfort level with new things, um, and other people breaking ground often for you. Depends upon your market. Well, our market demands that we take a quick break. So we're going to take a quick commercial. We'll be back in a few minutes. Stick with us.